Ahmad Bhaiji Sahib, Dr. Lita Khan Sahib, Prof. Hussaini, Prof. Rajiv Abdi, members of the Sayyid Amir Hassan Aapti Society, Memorial Society, representatives of the Iran Culture House, colleagues and young friends. It's really a great privilege for me to have been invited to deliver the second memorial lecture uh, in memory of Professor Aapti. I must confess that while I accepted with alacrity the honor the actual performance of the duty makes me very nervous, especially because Persian literature is not my field and there are present here scholars whom I cannot possibly hope to rival in the remaining years of my life in the language, uh, in, in the study of language and literature in Persian. My other weakness which would become clear to Dr. Dayagari and other Iranian colleagues who are present here is that my pronunciation of Persian is very North Indian. And I often find that my Iranian colleagues are unable to understand my Persian. I apologize for that because uh, my entire education in school and university has been in, in the Persian language through Urdu and do its Urdu pronunciation. Um, I will begin by saying uh, in the study of, when I begin the study of uh, the set of secular and radical elements in pre-modern Persian poetry, that my father, when I started reading Persian, <coughs> said that you will not find the real feelings in Persian prose you will find it in Persian poetry. And the reason is that because of the Islamic orthodoxy, the Muslims were fearful of saying in prose what they could say in poetry. And therefore, if you want to study Indo-Persian culture, you cannot simply study prose, you must study poetry. These are the real ideas come out in prose, uh, there are, there are no substantial ideas and everyone repeats what is generally well known and everyone wants to show that he is an orthodox person. Uh, I didn't realize it and for a long time as a historian I studied archival documents and chronicles and prose works and I hardly turned to poetry. <coughs> but I realized at the end of it all that Persian poetry is a very important element of medieval Indian culture. Also, uh, it is the Persian poetry which really leads to the evolution of the Urdu language and literature. And therefore, if one wants to study uh, a very important segment of Indian culture, you can't do without Persian poetry. During that study, it seemed to me that for a long time Persian poetry has been deliberately uh, forced into channels uh, which really uh, cannot be justified by a literal legal reading of the Persian verses. This is the main point that I should be making and I hope to illustrate it by uh, verses and couplets. Uh, from certain leading poets. I would apologize for the fact that my knowledge of Persian poetry is still very limited, especially since colleagues who are concerned with it, who are teaching it and studying it, uh, are present here. But I hope that my examples will carry some weight in the consideration of the points I will be making. First of all, uh, let's go back to the origins of Persian poetry. It is probably Khan who in his first volume in 1901 spoke of the Persian Renaissance. 
But if you Hungarian Jew, Ignacio Gorzaja, who really went back to the roots of the, of the differences between Arab and Iranian cultures, and the cultural and ideological consequences of the Arab conquest of Iran as far as Iranian patriotic feeling was concerned. <coughs> In his uh, work, it was originally styled Mohammedan studies, uh, but is now in order to cater to Orthodox religious style Muslim studies, which was published in Germany in 1889. Because I have pointed out <coughs> that Iran had an old civilization of its It was very rich. Whereas the Arabs had no such civilization. And therefore, in the original uh, uh, development of Islamic culture, not only Greeks, but Iranians also played a very important role. I might mention that Golda is the originator of the modern studies of Islamic history, and you can't do without Golda. He was a Hungarian Jew who was hostile to Zionism. I would say that when I start writing, I am neither a Jew, nor a Christian, nor a Muslim. I am just a scholar. So, whatever Gordana wrote has to be studied with great. In fact, he was the very young historian who first pointed out that a good literature began to exist in the first three centuries of Hijri, Hijra. Uh, relating to the dispute between Persians and Arabs. He gave the name from the Arabic sources to this movement on part of the Iranian people, Iranian partisans and the Shaubiya movement. Those who said that, those, uh, that anyone who was a Muslim was equal. But they went on to argue that the Iranians were all unequal. They were captured. And that the Arabs were although carrying the original message of Islam, but after all, after all, wrote much to Iran for their uh, cultural progress. The Arabs also wrote against the Iranians, uh, pointing out that God chose the Arab people for uh, sending the messenger of God to them. Now this controversy, I won't go into detail on this controversy because as Bodhara noted many of the disputes were racial and trivial. But the point was that the dispute and controversy existed and that Iranian people felt that within the Islamic civilization they had a particular position to uphold and they must protect their culture. Uh, it is also clear that although the works don't exist now, that a large number of uh, Bahili works were in fact translated into Arabic by Iranians showing uh, the cultural tradition as one can see from Tabri's history that uh, this also went into Arab historiography, the uh, Persian emperors, the traditional story of the Persian emperors, which ultimately formed the bedrock of it of <coughs> Now we must therefore understand that the Arab conquest created a very great cultural cleavage which promoted a kind of patriotic feeling among the Iranians which ultimately led to the Persian Renaissance. A sudden shift to the Persian language begins in the 10th century uh, with geographical works, with historical works, the Persian Tabari, and ultimately it took 10,000, in 2009 and 10, AD, the completion of Firdausi. And it is with Firdausi <coughs> that I will begin my argument. If one takes Shahnama, the major points of interest are two. Apart from the language, we, we know as Brown pointed out that 
Firdausi uh, reduces the Arabic, Arabic component in the Persian language from something like 35% and 40% as you can see in Persian prose works of the 10th century to around 4 and 5%. In other words, use the word Allah, either or Yalta, for instance. As far as possible, he avoids all Arabic words. And yet he creates a beautiful language. Look at what he says about himself. Vasayanj Purdam Dehim Saal Singh Atyam Dhinda Karnam Adim Parsi With my Parsi, with my Parsi I have turned Atyam alive. Not his loving word, but Atyam, Iran. I have turned it alive. And throughout Shahnama, with his romances, and by the way, all the beloved in Shahnama romances are women, none of them are men. So this theory that in Persian poetry the beloved is man should be first discounted. The romances are uh, ordinary romances between men and women. In this uh, history of Iran, Islamic history of Iran, the heroes are all non-Muslims. The culture is non-Muslim. They are certainly monotheists, but they are not Muslims. And then there is Iranian patriotism. The major enemy is Quran. Now the